Hello, this lecture is on the era of slave trade. The era of slave trade is a fascinating topic, but there is a lack of scholarship on slavery in the Islamic world. Far more numerous are studies on slavery and the slave trade in other regions of the world, notably North and South America. Scholar Ehud Tolendano argues that this shortage of investigation is due to political and scholarly restraints. According to Bernard Lewis, the extreme sensitivity of the topic makes it difficult and sometimes professionally hazardous for a young scholar to turn his or her attention in this direction. Interest in the topic can be interpreted, quote, as a sign of hostile intentions, end of quote. Caution is recommended to avoid any, quote, potentially unflattering image of Muslims. Centuries before the European exploration of the Americas, Arabs took millions of African captives to slave markets in the Middle East. But shedding light on this difficult topic is, dif is difficult due to the shortage of archival records. Before I discuss the Arab slave trade, I will summarize Arab life during the Umayyad dynasty and this was the dynasty that began in the 8th, 8th century and lasted into the 13th century. In an earlier lecture, I outlined the rise of Islam that began in the 7th century. On the one hand, the unifying idea of Islam resulted in significant success for Muslims to expand their land holdings, the, the territory that the Muslim armies had gained was rather huge, stretching uh, to the east, all, uh, in, e further east into the Middle East, all the way to the west, to, to Spain. In all regions of Islamic control, there was no separation of church and state. Islamic doctrine and politics went hand in hand. On the other hand, there were limitations to political unity. For example, there were independent uh, caliphates in Spain, North Africa, and Persia, and then we see that the Sal Salji Turks had taken control of Baghdad, which they did in the year 1055, thus controlling the eastern wing of Islam. So again, just if I put in other words, uh, on the one hand, Islamic doctrine, there was that unifying factor, but at the same time, there were some uh, different uh, uh, caliphates, different groups that did not really suggest a, you know, a monolithic political infrastructure. The rule of the caliphs was autocratic. The, the caliph relied on counsel for advice and the caliph used bureaucrats to govern the empire. The Muslim administration of conquered lands, including the use of local officials, especially when there was a shortage of Arab administrators. Economically, the Muslims benefit from controlling the trade routes to the east. From China came paper, silk, and porcelain, and from India some uh, came crops such as rice and cotton. 
The trade networks were a combination of desert and sea. His, historians refer to the fleets of the desert, which were camel caravans. On shorter strips, Muslims used horses and mules. So when we look at land transportation, it was primarily camels for the longer distance, but for the shorter distance, we see horses and mules being used. The, as far as the seas, the Arabs gained important na naval technologies from others. On the, on the Indian Ocean, Arab sailors depended on the astrolabe, and this was a device for calculating latitude that they got from the Greeks, and from the Chinese, they got the compass. So the Chinese in, invented the cust, uh, compass. These two, two devices then were very important for the, for the, the Muslims on the seas. The founder of Islam, Muhammad, was a merchant. Thus, Islamic leaders welcome mercantile activities. So we see that the, the you know, merchants were an important group within Islamic societies. The two wealthiest cities were Baghdad and Cairo, but not everyone experienced favorable economic conditions. The, the, the caliph and other high-ranking officials enjoyed a life of luxury. The caliph lived in a palace and was and, and which tended to be the most impressive building in an urban center. There were rumors that caliphs filled their harems with thousands of concubines. Historians suggest that such a luxurious lifestyle undermined the moral standard of Islam. In their world history, William Duker and Jackson uh, uh, Spielvogel write the following, quote, Divorce was common, homosexuality was widely practiced, and alcohol was consumed in public despite Islamic law prohi law's prohibi prohibition against imbibing spirits. End of quote. The luxurious lifestyle of these Muslim elites signific differed significantly from the bulk of the population. Much of the wealth went to the cities. Outside the cities were the peasant masses. And most of what the peasants were doing were living at farming, and so they were pursuing, you know, ag agricultural uh, lifestyle, living living on, out there in, in the hinterland and working their their crops, uh, primarily along the rivers. Now, as for those who refused to convert to Islam, and and you know there was a significant number of people who did not convert and if you and it's no surprise when you think of you know the as the waves of islamic armies are taking control of ever increasing land as the territory as the land holdings of islam grows you are you know encompassing you're bringing in all kinds of uh, people who in their ancestry, in their tradition, they are, were not going to follow a, another religion. And thus we have in these Islamic societies, there were a group of people who would choose not to convert to Islam. Now, those who refused to convert to Islam, they paid a very heavy 
head tax. So they were, they were especially singled out for, for additional taxes. Now, of course, the slaves experienced the worst economic conditions. As far as uh, the buildings, where people lived, in, in the urban centers, houses were generally stone-built on a timber frame. Wealthier pe people who lived in large multi-storage houses, they had balconies and an inter-courtyard. Thus, they had, you know, uh, their homes could be, you know, two stories, three stories, multi storage, and with that came balconies. But what was interesting is that these homes would be built around a courtyard. So there would be an inner courtyard where the inhabitants could escape the city, city noise and uh, dust. The homes of most Arabs were small and built with clay. In the desert, you don't have the Bedouins actually living in homes. Instead, they, they lived in tents. They were always on the move, traveling, so they, they would pitch their tents for a period of time and then move on. And, and so they did not have, um, they did not have permanent homes. The majority of the Arab population lived in the countryside where, as I mentioned earlier, they engaged in farming. The following is a Chinese account of farm life in Egypt. So this was a Chinese commentator speaking about the agricultural life in Egypt. Quote, the peasants worked their fields without fear of droughts. A sufficiency of water for irrigation is supplied by a river whose source is not known. During the season, when no cultivation is in progress, the level of the river remains even with the banks. With the beginning of cultivation, it rises day by day. Then it is that an official is appointed to watch the river and to await the highest water level when he summons the people who then plow and sow their seeds, sow their fields. When they have done, when they've had enough water, the river returns to its former level. End of quote. Of course, uh, the, the commentator here, the Chinese commentator, is, is referring to the Nile River, a, a life source for Egyptian peasants, for Egyptian farmers. And there's no surprise that the best agriculture land was along the, the Nile River in Egypt. As it was elsewhere, the river system, if, you know, further to the east, into the Middle East, you know, you have the Tigris and the Euphrates, and this was, this was compo composed what was been referred to as the Fertile Crescent. So these are, you know, the river being very important. Uh, the diet, the diet of Muslim people, first of all, they did not eat pork, so excluded pork in their diet. But those who could afford meat ate mutton, goat, chicken, and fish. As far as uh, uh, poorer Muslims, they had a meat only occasionally. And normally what, when these occasions were, they would throw the meat, some meat, in their meal of boiled millet. In the desert boiled grain was a substitute for bread. So out in the desert, they wouldn't have bread. Instead, they would have boiled grain. In Muslim society, males dominated. Muslim males have, have, could have more than one wife. Divorce was usually only an option for males rather than for females. Women could not have social contacts 
with a man who was not of her family. And there was expectation was that women were to be cloistered in the home overall. When in public, women were to cover all parts of their bodies. Now, as far as what their tasks were, the tasks were for, for women, well, I mean, outside of, you know, the daily, daily thing, daily necessities of, you know, cooking and, and preparing meals. An important task for women was spinning and weaving cloth for clothing. This is where, the, where they would make their cl uh, uh, clothing from, from the spinning and weaving they did. There was also rug, rug weaving, and rug weaving was a skill that was passed down from mother to daughter. As for learning, traditional Muslims were suspicious of classical ph philosophy and science. The intellectual Avicenna was imprisoned for suggesting that, quote, the world operated not only at the will of Allah, but also by its natural laws, laws that could be ascertained by human reason, end of quote. So such thinking was considered dangerous by various traditional Muslims. However, Islamic scholars did adopt India's uh, uh, numerical system, which included the use of zero. So this was something very important that the Muslims got from Indians, from India. And the inventor of algebra was a Persian mathematician. Adopting the work of Ptolemy, Muslims also produced a world map. Now I want, now I've just kind of, you know, gave you a, a very brief overview of some of the aspects of Muslim society. You know, the sort of the political infrastructure, the economics, and just the, the breakdown of where they lived, what they ate, what they did. Now I want to turn to slavery. There was slavery in every region of the Islamic world, but the slaves, uh, the slaves mostly came from elsewhere because a, a Muslim could not be enslaved. This fact and other facts on Arab slavery can actually be difficult to uncover. In his work on slavery, published by Yale University Press, historian Freeman writes that, and it's a fairly long quote, but, a, but, a, but it's an important message here, uh, important uh, uh, statement, comment on the, what was happening when, when it comes to you know, the scholarship on slavery. So uh, Prof Professor Freeman writes, quote, most Muslims, even many scholars have little or no knowledge of the modern history of slavery and its abolition in their communities. Educational curricula in secondary schools and universities, particularly in the Arab world, rarely, if ever, contain any references to the topic. Modern Muslim intellectuals essentially retreat into denial when asked to reflect on the Muslims wor on the Muslim world's long, deep, and continuous connection with slavery and the slave trading systems. So, so according to such scholars, there can be a difficulty in getting to, to uh, you know, a better understanding of what was taking place in the Islamic world with, with slavery. And so, so we have individuals like, like Bernard Freeman, who, who's written on slavery, who's researched slavery. He sees that there, there are some, you know, historical gaps in the case of slavery in, in the Middle East. The slaves trade 
to the Arab world and also l the later period when we have the Ottoman Empire. Slavery did take place in the earlier Arab period all the way up into the Ottoman Empire period. When Islam expanded, expanded in its first century, and I'm referring to you know the 16, 16 sorry the 600s into the 700s. So in the in if you look take a look at the first initial stage of Islamic uh, expansion of the seventh seventh and eighth century, there were ample captives for slavery. Thus, again referring to the land that was was uh, conquered by these different Islamic armies. As they're gobbling up land and territory, they, they are enslaving the people of these regions. Now, once the conquest of land and people began to slow down, you know, once, once the Islamic armies have, you know, con have control of all of North Africa, and then they move into Europe, crossing the Mediterranean Sea into to, uh, Spain, you know, once those boundaries be, began to kind of settle, there is not going to be any, I mean, there's going to be less, less people for, for con conquering where that they would, could enslave. Thus, when this process slows down, when Islamic expansion slows down, there is uh, Muslims seeking elsewhere to get the uh, their slaves, and so they would thought they would begin to seek slaves through commercial as as opposed to military methods. Some historians estimate that there were over seventeen million African captives in the Arab slave trade. So this this is. This number is over many centuries, of course, uh, and and I have seen the the number vary, but uh, it seems like some historians look at it. Um, they came up with a number of uh, approximately seventeen million. The two main routes for transporting slaves from Africa were by water. And that was from the coast of East Africa, and thus you would have slaves there on on the coast of East Africa, where they would be transported east uh, to the Middle East. And it, how it typically worked is that slaves were they would be gathered up into enclaves along the coast between what we now know uh, is, um, you know, present-day Somalia and Mozambique. That's, um, you know, picture, picture uh, Som Somalia to the north and Mozambique to the south. And, and along that East Africa, African coast is, is where the various slaves would would be gathered and and then transported across to to the Middle East. Now, uh, from there, they could be transported to the shores of the Red Sea and and the Persian Gulf. The second route, the second route of transporting slaves from Africa was the Trans-Saharan Caravan Road. The transported slaves came from the area of Niger Valley, or Niger, Niger Valley, to the Gulf of Guyana. The, um, no, the Gu Guinea. Uh, there was a difficult route, and I mean this this was a was a was a very difficult route. The crossing could take as long as three months across the Saharan Desert. Uh, given that land transportation had really not changed for many centuries, and and again when when you look at land transportation, 
land transportation of the Roman period. You know, you had the chariots that were pulled, say, by, you know, two to four horses or whatever, typically. And, it, and, and pretty much you get the same thing when you look at land, for ta- land transportation in the 19th century. The, you had two or four horses, you know, pull, pulling a coach. So land, tra- land transportation had not changed too much for probably almost 2,000 years. And because of this, this account that I have from a German explorer that was a ca- an account that later on, beyond the period of the period of the years that I'm looking at, which is primarily the eighth century to the thirteenth century, it still I think ha- can be instructive, and and I think it can tell us can. Um, Give us a clue of what what it was like for the captives as they were being, you know, marched across the Saharan. And this is what this German explorer wrote. Quote, The poor children of the black country seem to meet death here. And again, it's referring to the Saharan desert. At the last stage of a long and hopeless and painful journey, the long journey accomplished with insufficient food and scarce water. The contrast between the rich natural resources and the human atmosphere, uh, humid atmosphere of their homelands, again referring to, say, the Niger River, and the dry and anemic air of the desert. The fatigue and the and the fatigue imposed by their masters and by the circumstances in which they find themselves. All this has gradually ruined their young strengths. The memory of their homeland that has disappeared along the way, their fear of an unknown future, the endless journey under the blows, hunger, thirst, and steadily exhaustion have paralyzed their last faculties of resistance. If the poor creatures lack strength to get up and walk again, they are simply abandoned, and their minds slowly fade under the destructive effects of the rays of the sun, hunger, and thirst. End of quote. So this rather long quote by this German explorer, you know, paints a very uh, horrible picture of the experience for of the African captives as they're being herded and marched across the Sahara and to the various um, uh, slave markets, and 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 to no surprise, you know, many died on on this journey. So it's a very it's certainly a very sad sad chapter. If the survivor uh, if the captives survived their land or sea journeys, they were taken to the slave markets of Cairo, Baghdad, Istanbul, and Mecca. These were the these were were, were the major slave markets would be but there would be other urban centers where there would be slave markets. So again, the, the primarily one, prim, primary ones were Cairo, Baghdad, Istanbul, and Mecca. The range of work for African slaves was wide. Some became cooks, some became servants, porters, and there were even harem keepers looked after the harems. Others worked in mining operations, and there were some that were used in armies. Well, what about farming? Well, yeah, there were there were there were slaves, there were African slaves that were used for farming, but unlike the experience in the Americas, slaves were not always used for agricultural work. So the, there. When, when the slavery in the Americas, especially when you think of you know the various plantation slavery that was the case in in South America, Central America, and even in Southern America, there there are you know most 
most of the slaves being used out in the fields. That was not so much the case with the Arab world. You see, Islamic society was heavily composed of peasant farmers and consequently the need for slaves for farming wor work was not as high. Now slavery and in any part of the world was typically a horrible experience for the enslaved. There, there are some records of slave rebellions in the Middle East and this was this often began as a result as you know a response to the br brutal work and living conditions of the slave and 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 we see that this would include some just horrible uh, tragic uh, abuse by by the masters one rebellion that's really uh, rather remarkable for how long it lasted was was a rebellion that took that that lasted for fifteen years. This particular rebellion began in the year eight sixty nine near the city of Basra, Iraq, and it was led by an Iranian named Ali Muhammad. The Black slaves that that primarily composed this rebellion were known as the Zanj, and the Z, and that's spelled Z A N J. The the Zanj revolted against the harsh living and work conditions that they had uh, suffered under. Th these black slaves worked hard draining the salt marshes for farming but they were poorly fed uh, they they were fed like flour samola uh, samolina and, and dates it was not a very um, very good diet and ali muhammad this 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 um, iranian told them quote God would save them from it through him and that he desired to raise their status and make them masters of slaves and wealth and dwellings. So he uh, was promising the slaves that they could benefit from rebellion. Now the revolt itself was not against slavery this slavery was something accepted as a part of Islamic society as it was in just just about every other empire every other case in throughout the globe now the revolt was about having in essence better condition better working and living condition the Zans the rebellious slaves fought and they defeated anyone who attempted to stop them. Their victories over government forces resulted in them actually in acquiring slaves for themselves. But again, because because the we have such a, a dearth, such a shortage of uh, information, it, uh, it's hard to say how how many slaves they the Zans themselves acquired. And also what was interesting, while this rebellion was going on, there were others who joined the rebellion. And, and scholar, Islamic scholar Bernard Lewis writes that, quote, the, the black troops of the caliphate armies that were, had been sent against the Zans, they actually, many of these blacks who were in the army, deserted the army and joined the Zans. And this enriched the Zans with, um, you know, arms and trained manpower. 
uh, quote, while the prospect of booty brought them the support of the neighboring Bedouin troops and the Marsh Arabs, end of quote. The Zanj soon built themselves a city known as al Mukhtera. There are no records of the government structure of the rebellious slaves. However, there are accounts of their numerous military successes. In 870, the Zanj captured the commercial uh, sea seaport of Ubula. They, they gain territory in southern Iraq and southwest Iran. Iran. And, and, you know, as, as they're chalking up to all these victories, I mean, they're becoming increasingly, uh, you know, a, a, a serious threat to the empire, to the, to the Islamic uh, leaders. Throughout the decades, they experienced military successes and were, they got to the point where they were really close to Baghdad. They were, they were, they carried out raids within 17 miles of Baghdad. Well, this was, this could not go on. And so we see that Muslim leaders poured additional resources to, to defeat the Zanj. And by 881, the, the Zans lost all the territory that they had gained except for their capital of al Muqtara. Two years later, 883, government forces finally defeated the last stronghold and the Zanjas leader, Ali Muhammad, was, was killed and his head was delivered to Baghdad on a pole. Bernard Lewis suggests that the slave revolt of southern Iraq had no significant impact on the course of Islamic history and, quote, wrought no radical change in the structure of Islamic society. So it's his, it's his point that, you know, what, what did this accomplish? Well, anything that it accomplished were, you know, short-term gains for these black uh, rebellious slaves, the, the Zanj. And, it, and he, he suggests that, you know, nothing really came out of it as far as the, you know, Muslim societies and the Islamic societies. There was no, there was no adjustments to how one treated the slaves in the Islamic uh, societies. Uh, others, others have, su have suggested there was some further consequences, but again, it's, is a lot of it is you know speculation because there's so so little records uh, at least relative to other areas of um, of the world at this at this time, and again I'm, most of my attention is the eighth to thirteenth century. Actually, I I have found with uh, as as I've been you know reading reading and researching the the this this topic the era of slave trade. And slavery in the Middle East, there are no, uh, no surprise. There's much, much more written in the latter period. You know, particularly when we get into the late 18th and and 19th century. So, so much, and and of course, you know, ma many more. You know, uh, at much, much more evidence to to draw from in 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 understanding the dynamics of the era of slave trade. The, just to conclude, the Islamic world is a fascinating topic. There's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a fascinating history. As with the case with other empires, slavery was widespread in Islamic societies. For Arabs, African slavery was a significant enterprise for centuries. And, and you know, when you're, if, if you're having scholars 
who are, you know, they're coming in with numbers, you know, approximately 17 million African captives. You, one can see that just that number alone is, is significant and there's going to obviously have been uh, major consequences to that and that this was a, you know, a, a thriving trade. However, uh, shedding light on the extent and dynamics of slavery in the Islamic world is not an easy task. Thus, there are when when we compare, you know, the the slave slave trade and the slavery in a general sense, compare it to other regions of the world. There is, you know, uh, much much more work to do, much more scholarship to, to be done to to get a you know a fuller picture of what was happening in these Islamic societies. Thank you.